Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Salas, and we are opening up 2022 with a lineup of shows that's going to be a blast from our past. It's a total mix-up of some of the best of the best of our boozy banter with some of our most inspiring designated drinkers. So first, head over to designateddrinker.show to find a cocktail recipe four or five from our library of libations and get ready for some fun build flashback action. We may have saved the best for our fourth and last remix mix up episode. We've brought together three of our most insightful and empowering guests. We've had the privilege of hosting. They give us some hard to ignore facts on the amount of hunger found within North America. Open our eyes to some of the challenges our neighbors face in order to simply survive and prove that hunger knows no borders. But what they also do, they give us some simple steps each and every one of us can take to help fight hunger by learning how to channel the power of food. In countries as wealthy as the United States and Canada, it's truly a shame that many of us struggle to access good, healthy foods. Certain parts of North America are literally food deserts, and there's so many that go without. So let's jump right in to episode 197 with designated drinker and executive director of Food Stash, Carla Pellegrini, as she explains how her organization is rescuing food to help provide good, nutritious foods for those who may not otherwise have access. Tell us what the Food Stash Foundation is. Food Stash Foundation, basically we're the middleman between surplus food and people who don't have access to food, healthy, nutritious food. So we go around to a bunch of grocery stores and farms and wholesalers all around the city here in Vancouver, BC. We collect over 70,000 pounds of food every month. And then we redistribute it in a few different ways to other organizations with their own food programs, to families through our kind of CSA style food box program, and recently through our rescued food market. Rescued food, what's that? What is that? That's a good question. We call it rescued food. We're trying to kind of elevate this this surplus food. It's not waste. It's totally edible, extremely nutritious, perfectly good food that, you know, grocery stores, for whatever reason, it's, you know, the carrot is too big or it's approaching (laughs) the best before date. Uh, they They will just toss it in the landfill. So we're trying to get in between that process and prevent this perfectly good food from ending up in the trash. That is a that is a massive problem in globally. That's not just that's not just uh the United States or North America or Canada. It is a global problem and it is unbelievable the amount of food that we all produce in 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 general and waste. Yep. What was that number you shared with me when we we talked um Carla when you talked about the percentage of food waste to production? Yeah, and I think globally it's it's just reached 40% of all food produced is is lost or wasted or never consumed. And in Canada, it's actually 58%, more than half. And it's worse in Canada than the U.S. The U.S. is hovering around 40. Wow. It's crazy to think we waste more than 40% of the food produced in the world. 40%. There's so much work to be done. And designated drinker and chief executive officer of DC Central Kitchen, Mike Curtin from episode 168, shares how they use food as a tool of liberation. It's really important to understand when you're thinking, talk about DC Central Kitchen, is that it was, it came out of a disappointing, frustrating, confusing volunteer experience that our founder, Robert Egger, had. Here in Washington, D.C., handing out sandwiches and coffee to men and women living on the streets of D.C. Um, and, and he realized that that while the people, the individuals that were doing this were well-intentioned and, and had love in their hearts, um, it was really representative of this larger idea of charity, which, again, unintentionally had become more about the redemption of the giver and not the liberation of the receiver. So, so at the kitchen, we focus on using food as a tool strengthen bodies, empower minds, and create community. And all of those things are liberating. Like everything that we do has to be about liberation, opportunity, moving forward, getting to that better place. Uh, so ultimately, that's why instead of focusing just on food, we've really focused on training, culinary job training, working with individuals who have faced immense barriers to employment, like histories of incarceration, addiction, 
trafficking, abuse, homelessness, or other traumas, to get them jobs in the hospitality industry so they can uh, have self-sufficiency moving on to that that better place. In a nutshell, that's the case. I think it's amazing when we spoke earlier um, a couple of days ago, you were telling me that it was the the it's using the power of food and that it's that com- in what you just described, combining nourishment, nourishing the body, which obviously people who are hungry need this is obviously for life death situations, of course. But to your point, how do you help them move on beyond where they are so that I, I, I think it's amazing when you when you said you can't feed away hunger. For me, that was just like eye opening because without giving somebody the tools in which to be able to move forward and move on and be able to be self-sustaining, you are not, you're, well, it's a band-aid, I guess. And it, 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 when sure. you describe it to me, it's amazing. I, it, it really was eye-opening. Uh, so thank so you. It, it, it goes back to the old proverb that's been co-opted by just about everyone. It depends what refrigerator door magnet or bumper sticker you read. It could be a Chinese proverb. It's an African proverb. It's a Middle Eastern proverb, but give someone a fish, feed them for a day, teach them to fish, uh, feed them for a lifetime. Uh, but we 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 think in, in terms of what I mentioned that we're, we're we're a social enterprise. So we we actually run businesses. We earn over half of our income through catering, food contracts, our locally sourced scratch cook school food business, our wholesale business. Um, so we're really we can feed people, sure. We can train people, but then as an old Jesuit priest uh, said to me when I was at high school at Gonzaga, he, he said. That's great, but what if all the fishermen are unemployed? So like, hmm, okay. So we have to create, we have, so basically we have to figure out a new way to fish to go back to our, to your introduction and, and, um, in our time in New Zealand there. So, uh, we have to create opportunities for these individuals to become employed and to challenge the systems that have kept them unemployed to date. So that, that's really where, where we're, our focus is going forward. Using food as a tool. It's such a simple but amazing strategy. So simple. To not just provide nourishment, but to help people heal and gain the skills they need to get better jobs, which all can lead to helping people live better lives. Now that's truly amazing. In this bit, Gina poses a very interesting question, which in my opinion goes to prove that each and every one of us can do something to help the cause. They're working on a study now about like um, clean, the cleaning products during the COVID. pandemic, yeah. right? There was never a reason for anybody to do what they did, but people got so nervous they hoarded it. Yep. And I I know some people that are sitting on stuff they bought in 2020, yep. and they'll never go through all of it until like 2024. Yep. And they did it with canned food and stuff, and then they wasted it and threw it out. You know, I, I'm, I'm asking you, do you think it's those stores that did it? Do you think it's the giant, like, refrigerators you have in your house now that become as part of the problem? There's definitely part of the problem that's happening at the household level, for sure. Like, you you go to the grocery store and have no idea what you already have at home, so you just buy brand new groceries for the week or for that meal or whatever, and then you come back and realize that you already had 10 of something, so something's going to get wasted along the line. There's also this whole best before date thing. You see a date, and you automatically assume that it's like, if you touch it, you'll perish. (laughs) And that's just not true. You can, like, drink your milk two weeks after those dates, and it's totally fine. And and it's the same for all kinds of different foods and how, how we interact with those dates. But there's also waste at, like, Like even before you get your massive grocery cart full of food at Costco, Costco wasted a shit ton of food before you got there. And the people who who supplied Costco and the farms, like all the way up the supply chain, there's waste at for a whole bunch of different reasons. And here, Carla continues to give us some simple steps to help us make better decisions at the household level and explains how important composting is for the environment. There's a lot that we can do as individuals, correct me if I'm wrong, Carla, I'm sure you will, that we can do on a legislative le- level. You need to be involved and vote and push those agendas forward and support those agencies that are doing so. And yeah, what do we do? What do we do? 
Oh man, there's so many things we can do. So many, like as an individual, like take a photo of your fridge before you go grocery shopping or your pantry. Make sure you know what you already have and that you're planning to make meals with that as opposed to starting from scratch. That's just one little way to make sure that you're not overstocking your fridge, which will inevitably lead to stuff that goes bad. Um, yeah, and then just meal planning in general, like. Don't blindly buy whatever looks good at the store. Don't go to the store hungry. Try to have some sense of your meals in mind and buy only the food that you need to make those meals. And then the whole bus before date thing is like, just be willing to use your senses before you just blindly chuck something in the trash or or ideally in the compost if you are going to throw it away. Um, you know, smell the milk. Do the, the water test with your egg. If you think your eggs are, are old, put it in a glass of water. If the egg sinks, it's still perfectly good. There's lots of little things like that that we can do at the household level. That's a good trick. But systemically, yeah, for sure. Like There needs to be more pressure higher up in the supply chain to reduce the amount of waste that's happening right now. Expanding on the idea that one man's trash is another's treasure... Both Carla and Mike explain how thinking outside the box can truly make a difference. And if you can't repurpose it, for crap's sake, compost it. Yes, pun intended. When I was in the restaurant business, you're always looking for ideas, right, Gina? Like, what can you take from someone else and make it better, right? So I'll be honest, Every it was probably 2004 to yes. 2005. I was visiting, I was in Vermont with some friends, and I went to visit the Vermont Food Bank, which is one of the really cool food banks in, that do, do a lot of social enterprise work as opposed to just providing food. And the guy there, Ed Fox, had worked out this program where he was getting second tomatoes from farmers and turning into to, uh, tomato sauce and selling it to the local food system. So I was like, that's genius. So I ripped that idea off completely and took it in, in, down here and started, you know, started like, hey, can we make tomato sauce? That wasn't working out, but hey, we can still do the buying and purchasing and we can turn it into other products and we can and that turned into our whole school food program. So you know, you know, again, sharing these ideas, collaborating these ideas, uh, where where it, you know the the value isn't of isn't in me keeping my my intellectual property to myself. The value is in giving it away. The value is in sharing it. You know, so that's another advantage that we have. We can really rel you know just you know revel in in the sharing because if other people do better, then we do better. Like you know, sh- show me where I'm wrong. You know, that, that's what I want. <laughs> if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter in the world. Because wow. if your food scraps or just, you know, food packaged in containers that grocery stores are literally throwing into the bin, into the landfill, if that, you know, it gets buried at the landfill, there's no air, oxygen can't breathe, so it creates methane which is like 25 times more powerful, more potent, harmful for the environment than just regular oxygen, which is what happens if you actually compost those food scraps. So it's a huge environmental problem too. We've been working with um, uh, compost. So so I have a couple of my businesses are in Union Market District in DC and we have composting systems set up for the Union Market. And um, you know, in the beginning, we were giving scraps and people were like really not understanding wh- how, what we were really doing. And people were like, oh, whatever. And the customers were like, you know, there's compost bins and there's recycling bins and then there's trash. And then the compost bins are picked up and they're actually uh, utilized. And what's amazing is like after a few years, we were able to like give back mulch to people. And they're like, where'd that come from? And why is it free? We're like, well, it really isn't free. <laughs> it's really all of your vegetables and everything that you didn't use. I mean, you can't put dairy in, sure. in the compost bin because that's not good. You can't put meat scraps because that's, it can actually dissipate, but it will attract like raccoons and shit to your house. But you can make your own compost for your yard. Now, I realize if you live in a high rise, that that's not necessarily like doesn't compute, but you could ask your building where you're living to get this set up for them and like and then give this back to these giant farmers or people that do all this, you know, uh, different stuff or even, you know, help with deforestation. Deforestation. I, I can't say that. I'm from New York. I can't say the word. Anyway, 
you can help with that because there are a lot of places where they are taking compost and like all that stuff and they're rebuild, um, replanting trees and stuff. So that's another way to do it, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah. Or am I crazy no, right now? No, it's totally right. Like composting is huge if you can't. I think the first best option is with your food scraps is to feed it to animals. Reuse it that way. If you can't, get, if you can't find a farm that needs your food scraps, composting is definitely the way to go. And if you have a yard, you know, you literally just put it in a pile, kind of contain it and stir it every once in a while and it does itself. But cities for sure, like in Vancouver, the city has its own composting program. Like you put out your green bin the same way that you put out your trash bins and your recycling. And it's, it's actually illegal to have food scraps in the landfill and the trash here. How they enforce that is questionable, but, but most cities, if you live in a, an urban area, most cities have some sort of composting program. I, least, I used to live in New York City and you could bring your, your bag of compost to the farmer's market and there's some program that way. So there's definitely, like, do your research and find, find a way to get it composted. And talking about solutions, here's designated drinker Debbie Shore from episode 156, breaking things down and sharing how her organization, Share Our Strength, is breaking down barriers surrounding childhood hunger by providing access to nutrition that so many families so desperately need. Lou, as you said at one point uh, when you opened up, just how dire the situation is. And that's true. Although I would say that the one, you know, kind of bright spot, not that there's a bright spot in this pandemic, but the one positive that I can point to is, you know, childhood hunger, unlike so many issues that we care about, um, has a solution. And it's, it's, you know, the solution really is about access and connecting kids, um, connecting a hungry child. And this country has enough food and enough programs and enough services to do that. What we do uh, at the No Can Hungry campaign is figure out whatever the barrier is, right? So our funding goes to literally hundreds and hundreds of organizations around the United States, everything from schools right now, because schools had to pivot from feeding kids in school, right? That the core of our campaign was always around leveraging uh, meals at school, you know, for school breakfast and after school meals and summer meals, right? And then when schools closed, we had to pivot really quickly. And we were able to provide meals outside of the school for families to come and pick it up, but also, you know, food banks and shelters and feeding programs and pantries, um, boys and girls clubs. And, and whatever that, uh, you know, entity needed, whether it's, you know, PPE for the deliveries, whether it's transportation, whether it's, uh, you know, carts or, um, you know, whatever materials that that school or that center needs, we're on the ground to, to provide it. So our job has really been to understand the barriers around access and to knock those barriers down. And that's what we've been able to do. We've, um, we've just invested by the end of 2020, since the pandemic started, we've done about $55 million in emergency grants wow. around the United States to like that's more than amazing. 1700 organizations around. So the like country. I said, we were all going to get inspired. That is amazing. Well, you know, the, the, the thing that inspires me about this issue is when you understand why kids are hungry in America. Um, again, we don't have a drought. We don't have a civil war. Thank goodness. And, and we have plenty of food. So it's really about connecting them to the food that they need. And, and we can do that through all the great services. Uh, you know, here in D.C., there are just so many entities that are feeding kids right now. Um, and, and Share Our Strength is on the ground, meeting people where they are, meeting kids and families where it's needed. And bringing all this to a close, here's Gina getting a bit passionate about giving and how if you can just do a little, then damn it, do it. Because your little can go a long way. The truth is, when we put the needs of others above our own wants, the ripple effects of our giving can be so beneficial to so many, to include ourselves. For me, this just goes to prove that we are all truly connected and we are only as strong as our weakest link. When I was younger and I started doing this, I was probably a little naive to like the effect of like, your neighbor is receiving benefits, do you know what I mean? And then when you guys started the backpack program, I mean, mm -hmm. I can't. And I remember when you first started doing that, asking for volunteers in DC to pack backpacks and we went and did it. And 
you know, when you saw how many people were coming and like there was only a meal in there for the kid and then mm-hmm. those kids were sharing it with siblings at home. Of course, we did everything to raise more money to get the second meal for the family because I or that our family was sharing that backpack program over the summer. And I'm thinking like I work in a restaurant and like we eat the most ridiculous things. Right. And I'm like, do you have to really eat those ridiculous things sometimes? You know, and I'm like, we can give more. I don't know what it, I don't know what more you give, but you give more and you give more money or whatever it is that it needs to be because when I, I challenge everybody this year to really look inside of yourself. You survived 2020 and you'll see this podcast and you're probably driving to the grocery store or work or wherever it is. And you're, you're like 30 minutes, no big deal, popping it in, you're listening. To it. I challenge you to find some time or some money or a gift or all the people you write elephant gifts to. Forget the white elephant. Give them Go to go to share go to um Debbie tell me the website exactly yeah uh, nokenhungry.org is all go you need there. to know yeah go there and there is so many denominations you can choose from and then there's the other so if you want to live, give a dollar give a dollar it doesn't matter because that is going to make all the difference because you're going to feel better about yourself you're going to say you know what I didn't do a white elephant in my office for twenty dollars a person and it's really funny I gave a meal to family for a week for this amount. And I think that's what's different. So you're home, you can't go to an event. We can host an event. I'd be willing to do anything to get somebody to give so that I know that these kids in, you know, in PG County, this one school district ate for Christmas. Do you know what I mean? I just think that like, there's so much more we can do. And I, you know, in, the, in the school system, this doesn't apply outside of the schools as much, but in the school system, $1 connects a kid up to 10 meals. So that's a great, you know, that's a great equivalency for people to know. Um, uh, again, that's not necessarily the, the, the same equivalency outside of the school, but in the schools where we do a lot of work, $1 connects a kid up to 10 meals. Wow. So to your point, Gina, it's, you know, there's, uh, it doesn't take a lot um, for, for people to make a difference. Really yeah, I think it's when you think about it all year round, because um, to be honest, when we're recording this, we are before Christmas. When this probably airs, it'll definitely be post Christmas. So the thing is part of the new year. I think that we can look for those opportunities all the time. And to your point, Gina, uh, maybe it's one less cappuccino, maybe it's one less whatever, or um, things that we we don't even think about. Money that I would we love a Valentine. Really, I would love a Valentine that said somebody donated on my behalf. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would. That would be the greatest Valentine of my life. Or, you know, I, I don't need an Easter egg. I don't need Passover or something like that or a big meal. I don't. I've gotten all those things. I don't need that. I need people to look inside themselves and say. You know, I live in D.C. and there's a lot of people on benefits there. And you could say, what can I do? What can I give? How do I ensure that this kid is going to do better? So when I'm old and gray and in a nursing home, that this kid is going to make a better decision for the country that I help support. You know, like they are our future. And you're foolish to think that a hungry kid in D.C. doesn't affect an adult uh, and a 40-year-old in Texas at some point in your life. So again, to hear the full episodes with these thought-provoking guests, tune in to episode 197 with Carla Pellegrini, episode 168 with Mike Curtin, and episode 156 with Debbie Shore. But first, you know where I'm going. I'm heading over to designateddrinker.show. Where's that? We're going to designateddrinker.show. To find the perfect cocktail recipe to accompany our boozy banter with these incredibly inspiring designated drinkers. And on that note, the final message of our Remix Mix-Up series is to be kind, share your good fortune, and try to find compassion for all of those who call this lonely little planet of ours home. Cheers to that. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. 
Find Missing Links League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. Find out more about Missing Link. Visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.